Right. Well, um, Under Secretary for Disarmament, Izumi Nakamitsu, has kind of stolen my thunder, and in fact, even Tony did a bit, um, by remarking to the United Nations Security Council a couple of days ago in a largely proliferation-focused, NPT-focused speech, that the likelihood of nuclear war is as great as it has been for generations. Now, every year for the last five to seven years, I've spoken at UN plenaries on nuclear risks and nuclear risk reduction. And every year I've had to say, this is the riskiest year so far, because every year I've tackled the topic has been the riskiest year so far. This is like the climate scientist who says every year is the hottest year so far. It's getting hotter. It's getting riskier. Now, the trouble is, if you have a device like the doomsday clock where midnight's the end of the world, and you keep doing this, you start to run out of minutes. The doomsday clock's been at two minutes to midnight since January 2018. It is still at two minutes to midnight. Yet, in the period since January 2018, things have, in fact, gotten significantly worse. Should the clock hands be at 90 seconds to midnight, one minute to midnight? Should it perhaps be past midnight? Are we on borrowed time? One of the contributing factors seems to be that the awe and horror that nuclear war has traditionally evoked has melted away and nuclear threats are now made much more likely by people of extraordinary ignorance. There have been Donald Trump's threats of fire and fury, and more recently, Donald, um, Vladimir Putin's excursion into the theology of the apocalypse, in which he suggested that in the event of a full-scale US-Russia nuclear conflict, Russians would be raptured to heaven whilst the Americans would just die, not having had time to repent. Think what we may of the theology. It is, after all, just American evangelical thought mirror imaged. It shows a willingness to think the unthinkable, to take it seriously as a possibility and to use it as a threat. And that ought to chill the spine. Most recently of all, there's been the India-Pakistan crisis, which now appears not to have ended, but to be ongoing and simmering. A series of items by Reuters news agency reinforced by items in India and Pakistan's own media in the preceding week, the week following 26th, 27th of Feb, suggests that the nuclear authorities of both India and Pakistan did, in fact, plan missile launches, with Pakistan adopting a formula of three Pakistani missile launches on three Indian cities or one Indian strike on Pakistan. US pressure on India seems, for the moment, to have averted an exchange of missiles, which would have started being conventional so it would have quickly and easily turned nuclear. However, we now hear claims from Pakistan that India is planning an attack on what would be sometime this week. An India-Pakistan nuclear war would, of course, produce a prompt body count anywhere between 100 and 300 million, including a hell of a lot of friends of mine and a nuclear winter light that might cause another one to two billion to die from famine in the succeeding decade. The other major flashpoint is, of course, NATO-Russia. The nightmare scenario can be found beautifully and chillingly enacted in a BBC video of 2014 entitled Inside the War Room in which unrest in a Baltic state draws NATO and Russia into nuclear conflict. If you haven't Googled it and watched it already, do so. The other 
the doomsday clock folk were quite upfront that the election of Donald Trump influenced their two minutes to midnight decision. However, Hillary Clinton's Russophobia might have been as or more dangerous than Trump's casual talk of nuclear war. However, a number of things have gone even more wrong since Donald became president of the US. Both the US and Russia have proceeded, um, and this is something that started long before Donald Trump, with ambitious and costly modernization exercises. In addition, Trump has made statements that suggest or seem to suggest that he's comfortable with and would even welcome a nuclear arms race. These statements have yet to fruit into truly ambitious programs beyond that to equip some submarines with mini nukes in place of the 200 to 400 kiloton warheads that they would currently have. However, they've up, opened up a possible agenda of actual reversals in declining nuclear warhead numbers and placed an arms race back on the agenda. And of course, mini nukes, so called, are meant to be used. And so the bar for use comes down. The demise of the INF, while not of immediate import, opens the possibility and now the near certainty that both the US and Russia will test and deploy systems of ranges greater than 500 kilometers. The US insists that a Russian system has already been tested at ranges that exceed the 500 kilometer INF limit. Russia insists that the system in question has a range of exactly 480 kilometers. The US NATO case looked at in any kind of detail seems to be anything but certain, anything but inarguable, and Russian violation anything but blatant. But a false narrative has been created that Russia is in quote unquote blatant violation. That ain't so if they're in violation, it's marginal, dubious and debatable. But the demise of INF opens up the possibility that destabilizing systems within the INF prohibited ranges could be installed somewhere in Europe. If such systems were to be installed in, say, Poland or the Czech Republic, or possibly Romania, their flight times to Moscow and Petersburg are measured more in minutes than in tens of minutes, making measured decision-making about matters of apocalyptic importance all but almost an impossibility. Russia will, of course, install more missiles in Kaliningrad if it hasn't already done so. Beyond the INF, however, lies the New START Treaty, which will lapse in 2021. An option exists to extend it to 2026. Putin has said he would prefer to take that option. Trump has made it clear that he's uninterested in that option. If New START lapses, there will be no treaty-based nuclear arms control structures in place between US, NATO and Russia. Could a full-scale nuclear exchange actually take place between the US and Russia? The rhetoric, the atmospherics, what is sayable and what is being said by both parties, and that's terribly important, suggests that if enough things go wrong, if enough stupid decisions are said and done, it could. This doesn't mean, of course, that it will. It just means it's on the agenda. Such an event sequence would devastate the US, Russia and Europe. Could, probably would, also devastate China and would most likely end civilization. Australia home to critical US command and control installations at Pine Gap and Northwest Cape, 
would not be spared. All this hasn't even factored in the impacts of new monster ICBMs, not only in Russia, but also in China. Nuclear-powered multi-megaton cruise missiles, which may or may not work at all. Maneuverable hypersonic glide missiles, which compress decision-making timelines by arriving at their targets much quicker and monster doomsday torpedoes, all profoundly destabilizing. John, you're now at 11 minutes. I'm now at 11 minutes, I'll skip. Um, none have actually been deployed yet, but I obviously need to move to what we do about it. There is thus an immediate necessity to take temperatures down and to take immediate term measures, however modest, to step back from the brink. We actually know already what kind of measures will do this. And I refer people to the Section and the Abolition 2000 website in the Reducing Nuclear Risks Working Group. In the US, a number of organizations are working on no first use. Clearly, if nobody fires first, nobody fires. The glitch arises if someone thinks incorrectly that someone else has fired first. And my compliments go to Senator Markey and to other US Congress people for at least two congressional resolutions on no first use. Then there is lowering of alert status as envisaged in the operational readiness resolution in first committee, which I helped to make happen and a number of other resolutions, including reducing nuclear dangers. Better military to military communications, I'm getting to the end of it, um, or a resumption of military to military communications would help. So too would implementation of a 1998 agreement reaffirmed five times, but never implemented, or a joint data exchange center. Could two more paragraphs. A moratorium on large-scale exercises near the Baltic, Polish, Ukrainian or Romanian borders involving nuclear-capable forces would be of immense help. And there have been repeated such exercises. These measures and others outlined on the Abolition 2000 website would all be enormously helpful. All have been the subject of discussion within and between governments. None have been formally implemented. What is needed is the political will. Will it take an apocalypse or an obvious narrow escape from one to produce that political will? <laughs>